Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The man on my right played the leading role in one of the most historic explorations of our time. He wears the uniform of the Royal Canadian Navy. The vessel he commanded was the Labrador. His objective, to sail the Labrador through the Northwest Passage. This distinguished visitor to our series is Commodore O.C.S. Robertson, and our true story adventure this evening is titled, The Labrador Sails the Passage. And now, here to begin tonight's true story adventure is Jack Douglas. The 27th of September will long be remembered in the annals of the Royal Canadian Navy. On this memorable date, the Arctic Patrol vessel Labrador steamed triumphantly into the port of Esquimalt, British Columbia, to open a new chapter in the history of Arctic exploration. In just 66 days, the Labrador had literally crushed its way through the famed Northwest Passage separating Canada and the North Pole, a voyage over sea ice dreamed of by explorers and navigators for centuries. Now, the Labrador was not the first vessel to navigate the passage, but it was by some 80 times the largest to succeed, and it went on to become the first vessel in recorded history to circumnavigate the North American continent by way of the Northwest Passage. For the full story of this outstanding achievement and the actual films of this dramatic undertaking, it's my great privilege to present to you now the commander of the Labrador, Commodore O.C.S. Robertson. Commodore, it certainly is a privilege to present the actual films of this great undertaking on our program and to welcome you also to our series. It's also a privilege, Jack, for the Royal Canadian Navy to be on your show. Thank you very much. Now, Commodore, in order that we may all have a very clear picture of what we commonly refer to as the Northwest Passage, I wonder if you would define it for us on our globe back here, if you don't mind. Yes, it's only too pleased. All right, sir. Now, the passage, Jack, is actually from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It starts down here, Davis Strait, comes up around the top of North America, through the Queen Elizabeth Islands, around Alaska, and down to the Aleutians, Jack. Well, now, superficially, at least, Commodore, if our globe is correct, uh, the passage seems relatively simple. There's lots of open water in between the different islands, no narrow channels or anything like that. So why, then, did it take hundreds of years for explorers to find and navigate the Northwest Passage? Well, we had the same idea as you did, Jack, <laughs> until we went there. But this place is not accurately mapped. The, where it shows land is very often water. Where it shows water is very often land. There's ice everywhere, and that ice is tough and hard to get through. Well, now, since the passage had been sailed before, why was a repetition so important to the Royal Canadian Navy that it would risk a 6,700-ton vessel and a complement of some 230-odd men? Well, Jack, you see, the early people were exploring. We were a research ship. It was necessary for the defense of our country and your country to learn more about the Arctic. We wanted to find out whether it was possible to build a distant early warning radar line across the Arctic. We wanted to find out if submarines could go through the Arctic under the ice. These were all questions that the defense of our country uh, required an answer for. Commodore, tell us something about yourself now. What were some of your earlier commands and assignments? Oh, Jack, the usual thing that falls to the lot of a naval officer, minesweepers, destroyers, North Atlantic convoy. I served in 1941 and 42 with the Americans in the Pacific. I've had command of naval training establishments, officers training establishments, shipyards. Now, what was the starting point of the expedition, Commodore? Well, Jack, probably the best place to start would be Sorel a little French-Canadian town on the St. Lawrence between Montreal and Quebec, where the ship was built and where she commissioned. She's quite a ship. My bride says that she's the only real competition she ever had. We proceeded from Sorel down to Halifax, where we loaded our stores. We had to take stores for some 18 months. We didn't expect to be away that long. Was the sailing of the Northwest Passage the Labrador's maiden voyage? Yes, Jack, her maiden voyage. We took supplies for the Mounties, too. Our scientists brought their equipment on board. There were a lot of things to do before we got away, and we had very, very few days to do it in. On July the 23rd, we sailed for the Arctic. Just a short time after commissioning, sailed down Halifax Harbor, 
passing some of the other ships who saluted us, we were on our way north. The north that we didn't know very much about. There were only three of us in the ship who'd ever been in the Arctic before. And we were going to try and set the pattern for the work which was to follow. The navigator and myself plotted out our courses or proposed courses. The engineers went over their equipment, engines. The communicators tried out their equipment. Here's our track, northward till about 74 north. The oceanographers readied their equipment. There were nets to be made, gear to be overhauled. We stopped at several places to take oceanographic stations. Here we're collecting water temperatures, salinity, other information that we required on the ocean's depths. Well, now, this was information, Commodore, of a type that had not been of previously available to the Navy? Not in these waters. No research ship had ever been up here before. The chief scientist, Dr. Don Rose from the National Research Council, had his cosmic ray equipment on board. The hydrographers got out their aerial photographs from which we hoped to make accurate charts and maps. We then encountered the ice and hard weather, cold weather clothing was issued to all the ship's company. I had to send the helicopters out to see if the ship could get through between some of the islands. Now, is that the Labrador in the background? That's the Labrador. We met our first icebergs. This one, a valley iceberg, is 285 feet high. We sent the helicopters aloft to measure it. We also met our first walrus basking in the sun. There were hundreds and hundreds of them. They were a little annoyed at us, I think, for disturbing their sleep. This chap in particular, he was getting a little stiff in the flippers. When we reached Beachy Island, and some of the crew went ashore on Liberty, we were going to visit Sir John Franklin's old camp. Sir John Franklin, a Royal Navy captain, came up here looking for the Northwest Passage. And on his trip in 1847, he was lost, never heard of again. An international group erected this plaque to him and his two captains. We meet an Arctic tern, busy hatching her eggs and the product. <laughs> we then headed on further north towards Craig Harbor. The ice was getting thicker now. Some of this stuff is Oh, anywhere from six to 13 feet thick. When we encountered really heavy ice, as we did here, it evolved into a slugging match. We rammed the ice, it broke, we backed off, and we rammed it again. Well, now, Commodore, how thick are the plates of the Labrador that you can go through 12 or 13 feet of ice like that? Jack, this ship is built of one and five-eighths inch high tensile steel, just about as tough as you can make them. And she needed all that toughness to get through this sort of ice. Mm. As you see, we ride up on top of the ice and crush it with the ship's weight. Here we had a rather tough time of it. We're approaching Craig Harbor, and the harbor was blocked by a large field of paleocrystic ice. It was a real slugging match here. Ram, back off, ram again. It's about two and a half miles across there, and it took us about three hours to do it. And it makes a tremendous crunching and rattling sound as it bangs against the hull, hour after hour. This went on day after day, of course. At Craig Harbor, we picked up an Eskimo special constable, Ariak, his wife, his three children, and his 17 dogs. This operation had been prearranged before we left. The mounted police had asked us to move Ariak and his family. Everything they own in the world, we brought on board and moved them up to a more northerly post. His dogs were tethered out on the foredeck, and they were fed once a day. They're a hungry crowd. They'll eat anything. They ate the bosun's mittens. During the voyage up, the doctor got a chance to examine Ariak's family. It was going to be some three years before they'd see another doctor, and this gave us a chance to make sure at least that they were in a good state before they went to their new post. The young lad doesn't know what it's all about, but he did know that at the end of it, he got a chocolate bar. <laughs> 
This is Alexandria Fjord, the most northerly of all the mounted police outposts. We discharged Ariak and his family here into our landing craft, took them ashore with all their gear and a year and a half supplies. Well, now, were they to be the only human beings on this little island? No, there are two Royal Canadian Mounted Police constables and two Eskimo special constables with their families. This is the post. It's pretty isolated. It's in about 79 north. And we moved in, landed all the equipment that they'd require. Everybody turned to to help discharge, even this young fellow who found the long boards a little heavy for him. Well, now, Commodore, if there are only two or three families in this region, why did the Royal Mounted Police Station constables here? You see, this is a matter of sovereignty. This is Canadian territory, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police administer the law up here. The children were soon at home, and came time for our departure, and we headed south again, south towards Resolute, an RCAF base on Cornwallis Island. We carried out oceanographic and hydrographic surveys in this area. Each morning, the boats would go ashore when we could get them ashore through the ice. Otherwise, we flew the equipment in by helicopter. And they established hydrographic beacons. You see, Jack, there'd been no accurate charting or mapping up here. And one of our main jobs was to establish the positions of these islands using modern electronic method of charting and tie them down so that we could make accurate maps and accurate charts for the ships which were to follow us, thereby mapping the islands and tying them in with the general configuration of the coastline. We also carried out magnetic work here, calculations in the variation of the Earth's magnetic field the two ships which had gone through the passage before had been small ships, and they had got astronomic fixes, but these were not accurate enough for present-day maps and charts. These charts would be necessary if other ships were to follow us. Here, a party is just returning from having erected a beacon. This day it had rained, and the tundra was soft and clayey. The men almost needed snowshoes to get through it. It wasn't all beer and Skittles, Jack, as you can see. This boat had run in at midnight one night in a gale to pick up a party of scientists. She'd broached two on the beach. The temperature here was about 34 this day. The water temperature, about 31. A pretty cold, miserable job. It took us about two and a half days to get that boat off. Now, Commodore, did somebody lose a couple of stripes for this? No, Jack. The petty officer who is running that boat is one of our most capable men. It's a thing that could happen to anybody. Surely. It was about this point that a very curious adventure befell us. We received a distress signal from a little American vessel, the Monte Carlo, out of Boston, carrying a, a scientific party. She was in trouble. She was trapped by the ice. Navigator and I attempted to plot her position and make plans for going into her rescue. Thank you, Commodore Robertson. Part two of tonight's true story adventure continues in just a moment. According to our calculations, the Monte Carlo was about 60 miles away. So we decided to work our way up towards her, and then I would take off by helicopter and try and find her. It was going to be a long flight for the helicopters, this type, have got a range of just 60 miles. I flew off, found the little ship. In the meantime, radar practice, and I kept in touch with the ship by radio telephone. While I was away, the navigator worked the ship up closer as he realized that we were going to be rather short of gasoline by the time we got back. I'd seen the ship in the distance, and as soon as I arrived back, I held a conference with the senior pilot, on whom a lot of the work was going to fall, the navigator, and the commander, and tried to map out our plan of action to get in through this very narrow strait, up to where Monte Carlo was, and get her out. It was hard sledding going up, 
heavy ice and a very narrow channel. Looking at these pictures, Commodore, it's easy to understand why the early explorers failed in their attempts to sail the passage, isn't it? Yes, quite easy, Jack. They didn't have all the advantages of modern technology. They didn't have steel ships. They didn't have a lot of power. All the other things that we had. There she is. We found her at midnight on the 23rd of August. Tiny little ship stuck in a lot of ice. We towed her for about eight hours, and then the ice loosened a bit, and she was able to follow on behind us. A day and a half later, we reached open water. And we brought her alongside and gave her fuel and water and food, and then we said goodbye to them. They to return to the Atlantic, we to head on to the Pacific. After we left Monte Carlo, we proceeded to the westward, to Banks Island, where I hoped to pick up one of Stephenson's caches, which he had left many years before. While we flew over looking for the cache, we found a large herd of reindeer, caribou. We're about 150 feet above those reindeer. My pilot suggested that Santa Claus must live close by. We also met some muskox, a most curious beast. It looks something like a buffalo, large curved horns, covered with shaggy hair. When they're frightened, these beasts turn back to back to present a solid front to any enemy. It was while we were here that the Royal Canadian Air Force delivered our mail. One of their Lancasters flew over and parachuted mail down to us. Our helicopters flew into the beach, picked up the parachutes and mail, and brought the mail back to the ship. That's a big day, isn't it, Commodore? It certainly is. Mail anywhere is always welcome. In the Arctic, doubly welcome. Some of these lads had not heard from their wives and families for better than two months. Some of them had not seen their families for six months. They had been in Sorel while the ship was commissioning and had not been home. We then proceeded on further west through really heavy ice towards McClure Strait where I hoped to meet two American ships, the United States naval vessel Burton Island and the United States Coast Guard Northwind. I flew my helicopters in and they brought Northwind's captain, Captain Tricky, on board and we made a signal to the Northwind to join us so that we could have a conference and decide on our future operations. There's the American vessel, the Northwind. I invited the Northwind officers and her scientists to my cabin for a conference. Most of us had worked together before, scientists and sailors, and we felt that the three ships working together could do much more than three ships working singly. While this conference was going on, our crews exchanged comparisons of ships, grub, facilities, even the dogs visited back and forth. <laughs> My little Welsh corgi was most interested in making friends with the Americans, too. Northwind soon left us. She was to go on to Richard Collinson Inland, while I proceeded across to Russell Point, and the Burton Island proceeded down Prince of Wales Strait. We would then coordinate our scientific work, and we hoped come up with some of the answers which were required. Here, too, we met polar bears. One old man and a mother with two cubs. She was a little alarmed. She thought we were after her cubs, but actually she had nothing to be frightened of. She needn't have been worried. We were after scientific data, not dead game. The old man was a little annoyed with us. Just as he walked off with great dignity, I blew the whistle and it frightened him. He was cross about it. We then went on into the polar pack, where our meteorological experts carried out research. One of our jobs is to, was to find out how the Arctic weather affects our weather down here. And we carried out these experiments in the exchange of heat between the ice and the atmosphere.
Once this was completed, we headed west again. By this time, we were almost through the passage, heading down through Amundsen Gulf towards Point Barrow, along the Alaskan coast. Then we turned south into the Chukotee Sea and down towards the Aleutians. Now we were through the most difficult part of the Northwest Passage. It was quite a voyage. 10,000 miles, new ship, 66 days from Halifax to Esquimalt. At this point, I sent off this message to Royal Canadian Naval Headquarters in Ottawa. As Northwest Passage completed, I was proceeding to Halifax via Esquimalt, the Canadian Naval Base on the West Coast, and Panama Canal. I was exceptionally proud of my ship's people. It was rather fun getting into Esquimalt. Everybody dressed up in their best, beards off. There we met the Little St. Roche, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Ship, and we flew our polar bear flag in her honor, a flag that's only flown by ships which have completed the Northwest Passage. We came alongside the jetty to be met by friends, relatives, also the naval band from HMCS Naden. Jack, I'd like to add a postscript to this voyage. When we got back to our home port of Halifax in Nova Scotia, after going through the Panama Canal, we held the traditional service on board Labrador, a tradition for British and Commonwealth ships for many years. We baptized the children who had reached baptismal age while their fathers were away on the voyage. And I read the naval prayer, which gives thanks for our returning to the land to enjoy the fruits of our labors. Thank you very much, Commodore. Now, Commodore, what were some of the scientific achievements that were recorded by the Labrador during this memorable sailing of the Northwest Passage? The uh, charts that we made are now being published by the United States Hydro and the Canadian Hydro people. Uh, other ships are using them. The work we did in Cosmic Ray is now being used in the work of the International Geophysical Year. We set a pattern to evolve some of the techniques for research which is going on today. I see. Would I be violating security if I were to ask you just out of plain curiosity whether or not the Northwest Passage can be navigated by submarines? Uh, that is a little... We'll skip it, Commodore. Now, Commodore, we saw the Labrador plowing through fields of ice, literally some 12 and 13 feet thick, and keeping in mind, as we've been told many times, that some 85% of an iceberg is submerged. Well, how were you able to proceed with such confidence? How did you know, for example, that some floating uh, piece of ice wasn't really an iceberg? We kept pretty good track of them on radar uh, and sonar. It showed a large blip for a large iceberg. But frankly, Jack, if there are icebergs around, you keep away from them. No matter how big, how strong you are, an iceberg can sink you, it can sink a surface vessel, or it can sink a submarine. Mm -hmm. Well, now, are you still in command of the Labrador, sir? No, I left Labrador and went on loan to the American Navy in connection with their Arctic operations, and I'm now stationed in Washington, a uh, naval member of the Canadian Joint Staff there. I see. Well, Commodore, I know that I speak for our entire audience in telling you again that we've been very privileged to present these films. They're very dramatic, they're memorable, I would say they're even historic. It's been a pleasure for us to welcome you to our series. Thank you so very much, and our sincerest thanks to the Royal Canadian Navy as well. Thank you, Jack. It was a pleasure. We wish you a very pleasant return, Commodore, to your duties in Washington. Thanks again. It's been my pleasure, Jack. Mm -hmm.